one more question. Ask again. Two point two number seven. Oh, and can you also just talk about like when we should be using permutations over common? Like sure. Um, All right, so 2.2 number seven, how many ways can the coach at Tall U fill the five starting positions on a basketball team if each of his 15 players can play any position? Okay, so general thing on combinations, permutations, right? Permutations pay attention to the order. Combinations ignore the order. I don't know a good mnemonic for remembering that. Just write it down somewhere. Um, permutations are ordered, combinations are unordered. Um, yeah, but in my experience, sometimes it's difficult to tether to tell whether order is important. Or not. Right, right. Um, so, how many ways can the coach at all you fill the five starting positions on a basketball team if you have 15 players and they can play any position? So, the order in which you say you're going to play center, you're going to play something else, doesn't matter, right? Um, when you're done, you have a team of five people, each of them assigned a position. Um, the fact that this person got their assignment first doesn't really change the final, uh, the final solution. So this, this feels like a combination problem, right? And you're, you're, um, but this may actually be before we actually talk about combinations and permutations. This is more like a, uh, a product rule. Um, See, but that's a question I have about that. It seems, and I, and I wrote that on my homework because I wanted you to talk about that. It seems to me like it's a product rule. Mm -hmm. But then the product rule says each case has to be independent from the last. Well, mm -hmm. these, are, these are not independent, though, it doesn't seem to me. It, 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 you, if you pick the first player, then 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 you, you, you can't pick that player for the second position. Right. So the number of possibilities changes after you pick the first player. And so, and so the picking of the first player makes the picking of the pl second player dependent on the picking of the first player right. and, and, and so on down the line. Mm -hmm. And so that means there's a dependence and that would seem that the product rule does not apply, but then that's the way I did the problem. Well, yeah, so, so I would think of this as, as what's our task? Um, pick five players for given positions. And I would break this into five subtasks. Task one, pick a player for position one. Task two, pick a player for position two. All the way down to task five, pick a player for position five. Does that seem like a, a reasonable way to choose five people to fill these five positions? Mm -hmm. Right, so pick a player for position one, then pick a player for position two, and so on. So the number of ways that you can pick a player to play in position one is 15, because you got 15 players you can choose from. After you've completed that task, now you do subtask two, which is pick a player for position two, and you only have 14 players left to choose from. So you've got 14 ways you can do that. And if we generalize, Right, the last position we can fill with any of 11 possible players. And so the number of ways to complete this entire task is just the product of those number of ways we can complete the subtasks. And now you could obviously do that with combinations, right? Yeah, so this is actually equal to 15 factorial over 10 factorial. Right, because I went from 15 down to 11, and then the ones from 10 to 1, I didn't multiply, so I divided those out, which is 15 factorial over 15 minus 5 factorial, which is the number of permutations of 5 choose 
a 5 out of 15. So why is that a permutation instead of a combination? It's assuming all of the starting positions are essentially the, under the same category? Basically. So if we, if we simply said, pick five people to be on the team, then it doesn't matter the order in which we pick them. We could say it's going to be person A, B, C, D, E. We could say it's going to be person E, D, C, B, A. It's the same team, right? That's a pure combination question. How many ways can you pick five people out of 15? But the order matters here because we're assigning these people to particular positions. So we're not just picking five names out of a hat. We're saying, OK, we're going to pick position one, position two, position three, four, and five, right? And so if you pick people A, B, C, D, E, person A is position one. If you pick person E, D, C, B, A, person E is position one, right? So, so to pick people and assign them to positions, we're, we're imposing an ordering on, on that selection. And so it's, it's actually the number of ordered um, ways we can choose five out of 15. So combinations, is it like you're creating like a set? Because sets aren't ordered. Right. Like um, yeah, it could have duplicates maybe, but, um, but yeah, they're unordered. Um, so it's just like, you know, I just have a pile of five people that are going to be on my basketball team. And there's no first person, second person. Does that address anything that you were asking? Yeah. I it's been so long, I can't even remember how I did the problem now. <laughs> okay. But uh, what you said is, is reasonable. Um, but my question was, is this an application of the product rule? Yes. Yeah, this is, this is straightforward product rule. But then the product rule says it doesn't apply in situations where the cases are not where they're where they where they're dependent it only applies where they are independent that's what as i read the product rule. i don't think that's, that's okay am i doing it wrong yeah i mean i mean usually when we do the product rule we're trying to find how many ways we can do each of these right there usually is a dependence right the number of ways we can do t2 is different from the number of ways we could do t1 right because it depends but um I don't think we can address a case where the number of ways to do T2 would vary based on the choice for T1, right? Maybe I'm just interpreting it or reading it or interpreting it. You may be reading it more right. deeply. Yeah. Right, Maybe so so, so suppose there was some problem where if we pick person A for position 1, then we have five people we can choose for position 2. But if we pick person B for position one, we have seven people we can choose for position two because more people like playing with them, right? That we can't just use a product rule on. Right, so in that sense, mm -hmm. this has to be independent of the choice here, right? But the fact that it's task two means this is gonna be a different number from task one. Okay. So you can show me what you were looking at if you want. We can. See if there's something deeper going on there. I was just kind of feeding off his question. OK. There's a part B. And there's a part B, which says, what is the answer if the center must be one of two people? So center is one of the five positions in basketball. Um, so here, we're told that, that the center can only be one of two people. Um, So I don't know, let's make T1 pick the player for playing center. And we're told there's only two ways we can do that. So the number of ways we can do this becomes two. But then the number of ways we can fill position two is still 14 because we've only used one player, right, to play center and so on. So this is two, 14, 13, 12, 11. So be two times uh, P14 and 4? Yes, yeah. Right, so you could do it like two tasks like that. Pick the center and then pick the other four players, which is P14, 4. Four. 
If you try to do this without picking the center first, you get yourself potentially hamstrung because if we say there's 15 ways we can pick position one and 14 ways we could pick position two, we might have taken the only two players who could be center and already assigned them to positions one and two. And then if T5 is the job of choosing the center, there may not be a way to do that. So that's why I picked the center first. These are, these are simultaneously some of the most frustrating but also some of the most rewarding problems to work on because there's so many different ways to look at it. And the real challenge is, is understanding why looking at it a particular way will get you the solution or won't get you the solution. The mechanics of using the permutation formula or the combination formula are, are usually not the big challenge, right? Those are kind of mechanical. It's really thinking about does order matter, is this a product rule, is some rule a combination, that kind of thing. All right, and someone came up and asked for some other questions. Oh, uh, 2.4, number five. 2.45. Uh, the binomial expansion? Yeah. Uh. Uh, well, you don't have to do the whole thing. Yeah. So, so general binomial theorem, a plus b to the fourth, um, Right, is the sum of all of these these products of powers of a and b, and the coefficient in the front is four zero four one four two four three four four. It's the number of combinations. My brain is really spacey right one, now. Four, six, four, one. Thank you. Right, so then plug in two X for A minus three Y for B and just go to town. Um, there was, I can't remember which one it was. There was, I don't have my book and I don't have a PDF file, but there was one of the problems that that I wanted to look at, I wanted you to talk about that, ask you, to, it, it said in it, it said, uh, it gave a hint, it gave, said there's, there's, there's two possible answers for this question. Oh. And, and I, vaguely I, I came that. up with four and. Four possible answers? Four or four possible, is an answer? Yeah, so oh. I, I didn't know, I didn't understand the, the division into two cases that I, I, I didn't understand the, 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 the two cases that they were dividing things into. I didn't understand what they were. I don't know which problem was. Problem yeah, I've was. definitely seen it. It was about um, making eight letter words of 26. Oh, uh, OK. Is that it? Textbooks is not great. Um, anybody know what section or number that was? I could look at my homework and tell you. What is it? 2.23. Let's try that. How many eight letter words can be formed? All right. Um, There's two interpretations and and all I remember is that I have four, and four, four, like a, a matrix of two by two, 
So, so what are some of the interpretations? Maybe somebody else has an answer. Perhaps um, the two interpretations I thought of was one where letters can be um, repeated and one mm -hmm. where letters cannot be repeated. Right, right. That's the two that I normally thought of. Because then it's it's a. Uh, uh, what what were they? Either either words that are allowed to use the same letter more than once, or that you can use a letter only one uh, time. Yeah, I, that, yeah, I, that's I came up with that too. So. Okay. Because it says formed from the letters from the twenty six letters, so that kind of suggests you have twenty six letters and you want to take eight of them and form a word, which sounds like you can't repeat. Right. But usually when we talk about an eight-letter word, we're not saying you can't use the letter S more than once. So I think those are two interpretations. Okay. I think I, I included those in my four cases. What, was, what were the other ones? I'd have to look at my paper to see. The order of letters, possibly? Possibly. So would it be like... 26 to the 8th versus permutations of yes. 26 over Yeah, because if, if you're allowed to reuse, it's just 26 to the 8th. Yeah, the repeated letters either are or are allowed or not allowed, and the order of the letters in the word matters. Ah, the okay. Order of the letters in the word does not matter. Okay. And in the case where it was, I came up with something for each of the four that seemed to make sense, but I don't know if it's correct. But then for the case where it was repeated letters are allowed and the order of the letters does not matter, I couldn't come up with a formula. And you could look at what I got. But uh, Yeah, so we, we haven't covered how to do repeats with ignoring order. Because you're looking for combinations where you're allowed to repeat. Well. And that's not going to be a straight combination is, is formula. That, there's something called multi- is that what we're talking about? Multi. Uh, I've seen it before. I've never studied it or used it. But mm -hmm. It has something on the top and on the bottom. It has multiple, oh, oh, yeah, multiple yeah, yeah. factorials. Yeah, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is either. I, I thought that's the only thing maybe it would work, but but so I didn't. But then again, if if, if the division of the two cases is like you said, I did them in the problem, so. So I think I think if you want eight letters, an order doesn't matter. Um, and we're doing no repeats. No repeats, which is the one that doesn't. I did both of them, but I can't remember what I what I came up with. But but there was one we were just talking about that was difficult. Oh, uh, the order does not matter, and. Repeats. Uh, Repeats are allowed. Yeah, I think so. That's um, I could not come up with a formula. Because if repeats are not allowed, then it's just um, 26 choose 8. Right? It's the number of unordered combinations of 8 things taken from 26. But this is, this is not allowing repeats. Um, if we want to allow repeats, right, the number of ways we can just pick eight letters is 26 to the eighth. It's eight subtasks, 26 ways to do each. If you divide that by the number of ways you can rearrange eight letters, yeah. right, that gets you closer, but I don't think that's exact because... That's, that's the kind of thing I was thinking about, but... Because we're treating this as as different from that, where we swap those last two letters, even though they're the same word. So it's actually smaller than that. So yeah, that's, that's a really subtle change on the question that actually makes it a whole lot harder to, to come up with an answer. Well, that's a fun one to think about. I'm sorry, what is your name? Julian. Julian, what Julian said a minute ago. I, I, I'm satisfied. I, yeah, yeah. I think I did those two cases. Okay, cool. All right, what else? And just your saying that that was maybe a little bit harder. Yeah. Satisfies me. Okay, cool.
about the one with the straight lines and the dots? Oh, yeah. Draw a series of dots and you want to know how many straight lines you can draw connecting mm -hmm. dots. Well, are these lines directional? No, they're just lines. So five dots. And we can go foomp, 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 foomp. All right, so how many different lines can we draw? Or more importantly, how can we think of that question in terms of combinations or permutations? That was one where you had to do up to 10, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I find it difficult to think in those complex terms. I just started with smaller cases, mm -hmm. three, and then four, and then five, and okay. six, and s saw a pattern and okay. predicted for 10. Um, but is it incorrect that I, it seemed to me like there was no loss of generality. You mentioned the other day about Wolog, Without loss of generality, and sometimes yeah. that could be misused. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just put them in a circle, I didn't think there was any... That probably works. I didn't, I didn't see any loss of generality. In the geometer would argue with you probably, but I think that works. <laughs> But I find it difficult when they ask a question like that to think of a more complex case. I just try to uh, simplify it to a, a case that I can understand. It. Okay. So how, how could I draw a line between two dots here? How do I possibly do this? It's a bit of a trick question. I have to choose one dot. I have to choose one dot. Okay, I don't know, maybe I'll choose this dot. I'll circle it. And then what do I have to do? I have to choose another dot. Can I choose the same dot? Nope, got to choose another dot. And once I've chosen two dots, I can draw a line. If I decide I'm going to choose two other dots, I get a different line. So the number of lines is exactly the same as the number of ways I can choose two dots out of these five. All right, which is just that. The order in which I choose the dots doesn't matter. If I had chosen this dot and then that dot, I still get the same lines as if I choose that dot and then this dot. So the order is, is irrelevant. It's really just pick two things out of these five, that gives us a line. If I pick a different two things, that gives me a different line. So the total number of lines, the total number of ways I can pick two out of five, that's this. So five factorial over two factorial times three factorial. So didn't this problem say pick out of 10? So I you're saying if you think remember. of it combinatorially, combinatorially? Sure. Uh, there are 10 points. How many lines are determined by the points? How many triangles are determined by the points? No, I think that's just 10 choose ten 2 choose three. and 10 choose 3 for triangles. 10 choose, ten choose 2 and 10 choose 3. Yeah. So if you're thinking, well, okay, okay, so I did that. Mm -hmm. But then, how do you convince yourself that that's correct? Well, the yeah. reason, the reason it does. So then I did the cases to try to see a pattern. And the geometric pattern that I saw came up with the same number that I chose when I did 10-3. Interesting. Because it's not that I don't understand. I do believe the combinatorics. Mm -hmm. But then again, I don't. I want to convince myself that right. it's correct. Right. So I did something that I, that I really believed in. And when I came up with the same result, it, it helped me believe more in the in the combinatorial co reasoning. So what if we try to do this recursively? Suppose A of N is the number of lines oh, yeah. that we can do with N points. And we know some number that we get for five, right? If we add one more point Let's put one point out here and say now how many lines can we draw between 
pairs of points. Well, we could totally ignore that. We could just draw lines between those original set of five points. That's A5 ways we can do that. Or we could draw a line between this point and any one of these five points, which is, you know, N. And I think that tells us what A of 6 is. Now, you said, what if we think of this recursively? And then you went through a process that allowed you to come up with a recursive formula. Mm -hmm. Can you give us students any... This was your question before the yeah. term started back in summer. Back, yeah, back in the beginning. Yeah. I thought they were going to be a little bit more on recursion. And the whole point, the, the exact question, for, for everybody else in class, I've studied a little bit of recursion. And and to, and to be, what was it? It's how to come up with the recursive formula. Right, that, right. That, do you have any advice? So, so I was just kind of thinking about it in terms of generally when we're talking about recursion, we're really talking about induction, right? We're talking about recursion, um, it's how do you move from a given case to a case that's slightly larger, right? In induction, we're proving something for n, we want to prove it for n plus 1. In recursion, we've got a formula for doing something with n, we want to make a formula for doing something with n plus 1, for example. So I was just kind of thinking out loud about if we've drawn lines between n dots, and we add one more dot, how many more lines can we draw because of that one more dot? Just five more. And it's just five more, right? Um, we can still draw all the ones that we had before that don't involve this dot, but if we have this new dot, right, that's going to be one of the points in our lines. The other point has to be one of these five. So this is kind of like the odd pie fight, where you added one more person to the, the room with a pie, and we split into two cases, right, where this did not affect the line you were drawing, or it did affect the line you were drawing. Maybe that's something I was channeling. Um, but, but so if you just do it for n dots, right, if you add an extra dot, n plus 1, you have all the original lines plus n more possible lines where you're including this new dot. Um, and so presumably, Presumably, this is a recursive formula for n choose 2. And so, so again, what you're doing is you're trying to relate two different ways of coming up with the solution mm -hmm. and see if they come up, see if they're the same. Yeah. And then that leads to creating experience and belief in each mm -hmm. of the two methods. Yeah, yeah. But then, but then the recursive thing that you just did relates to induction too. Yes, yes. Very close. That's what you said at the beginning of the right. Time too. So, so we can we can very easily prove that this is a valid function a n for how many lines we can draw through n dots, right? By using this line of reasoning, and then we can do what's called solving the recurrence relation, finding a, a form of a n, you know, as a formula that satisfies these conditions. And, and the claim is that this is such a formula, because this is the formula for n choose 2, right? n times n minus 1 over, um, well, n factorial over n minus 2 factorial, which is just going to be n times n minus 1. Um, So, so maybe that's a fun exercise to play with, just if you're curious. See if, if 
this recurrence relation actually gives you and choose to. So, so am I, let me state this in a way, I want you to tell me if I'm mm -hmm. thinking of it correctly or not, where I'm trying to relate mathematical induction and recursion. Mm -hmm. In mathematical induction, you're going from the nth case to the nth plus one case. Mm -hmm. and the way you just explained it, with recursion, you're taking the nth plus one case and seeing how you can how you can relate that to the nth case. That might be true. That might just or be might a quirk of the way I did it. It might not be true. Yeah. I don't know if that's if that's gonna be a rule or not. But that might be. I feel like they should both be going in the same direction. But yeah, this is this is absolutely correct. It's a fun it's a fun inductive proof actually. Yeah, but, but I just but, did it. But, but again, at the beginning of term, what I what I asked you was, given a recursion, How do you get this? given a recursion formula, to me it's not too difficult to find a closed form. Okay. But but the problem for me was given a like a word problem or a story problem mm -hmm. how do you come up with the recursive relationship right right and the way you just described how to do this just now was instructive to me okay but is that going to be a general process you could do start yeah. with the nth case and just add one more to make it the n plus one case and then and then that seems to be how i go about it is that how you go about it yeah okay it Although it's possible that starting with the n minus first case and going to n might for some reason be easier, um, or something like that, or going from n to n plus 2. Well, you're going from the n plus 1 case, but you're trying to relate it to the nth case. Yeah. And that's what, just what you did. Mm -hmm. But you can think of it the other way, too. Yeah, like yeah. Starting with the nth case and going to the n plus 1 case. Right, right. Um, but that was instructive to me, the way you just did that. Okay. But then the whole point is, is that a general technique that you can apply to? I think it's pretty applicable. Okay. Um, but but you can you can take a lot of the stuff that we do in here in programming or things like that and try to, to come up with a recursive definition and sort of exercise that. Trying to come up with the next prime is, is not going to work as well. <laughs> but it's still instructive to, sure. to think about the pieces for that. All right, other questions? So I got gold box graded and that looked really good. Um, the only issue I saw, which was like a five point issue, was um, remember that one is not considered a prime so when you're generating primes, start from three if you're only looking for odd primes, two if it's all primes. Um, but one's not a prime. And also, when you're checking to see if something is prime and you're looking for divisors, you have to go up to and including the square root. So 25 is not prime. But if you only check one and three and then you say, well, five is not less than the square root, you'll miss that factor. So it specifically misses squares um, of primes. But other than that, everything looked good, nice coding. Um, Good job on all of that. Um, all right, so we were talking about um, languages and parsing and things like that. Um, so my, my plan is to, to spend today and Wednesday talking about the rest of this chapter, which is basically looking at um, what's loosely called automata theory. Right? We're, we're dancing around the edges of it. You'll do a whole course on it later on. Um, but looking at languages and parsing and, and taking something and seeing if it conforms to a language and so on, um, which will lead us to Turing machines, um, finite state machines, Turing machines in particular, and then um, discussions of computability.
All right, so we were talking about Bacchus Nauer for him, BNF, on Friday, and we looked at, at BNF for, um, for C, and we looked at BNF for an arithmetic expression. Um, and we could look at that from a programming perspective, but that's going to take us a little far afield here. So, um, so let's talk about finite state machines. So if you've done Engineering 250, you did FSMs till you were blue in the face, probably. We're not going to go into them in the detail that we do in 250, where we're actually building these things out of flip-flops and logic gates. We're interested in the use of finite state machines here. What are they, what are they usable for? How do they behave as opposed to how do we build them? Or, you know, here's a circuit, what does it do? Um, so finite state machine, we really think of these four tuples, um, present state, input, output, and next state. So state is just, you know, some aspect of the system. Um, it could be the value of some variable. It could be the value of a collection of variables. Um, but it's something that, that um, you know, it's the state in which the machine is in. It's, it's fairly abstract. But we have a notion of being in a particular state, having a certain input to the system, and wanting to generate some sort of output and move into a new state, which could be the same as the present state. So we have these, these four tuples, present state, input, output, next state. Um, and in Engineering 250, we make these big wide tables right on the big long sheets of paper that list if you're in this present state and this is your input, here's your output, here's your next state. Um, so let's, let's make this a little more formal. Let's define in a machine as a six tuple. Consisting of S, I, O, F, G, and S naught. So S equals a set of states. S0 is what we call the initial state. So it's the state the system begins in. I is the set of inputs. O is the set of outputs. And then we have two functions, f and g. So f takes in a state and an input, and it generates a new state. It basically says if you're in a given state and you have a certain input, what's your new state? And g says if you're in a given state and you have a certain input, what's your output going to be? So these are, are the maps from one moment to the next. And in a finite state machine, these collections of states are finite. The input could be infinite. But the set of states is finite, so it only has um, you know, a finite number of states it can be in. Um, and when we build these machines, we envision a clock of some sort. And it's when this clock ticks that we make these transitions from current state to new state. Right, so, so we're applying this function f continuously each time some event occurs, a clock tick. We look at the current state and we go to the next state. So, so that's, that's a, um, a fairly abstract notion. Um, and we can distinguish Mealy and more machines based on the nature of this g function. If, if, um, if the output only depends on the state, it's a Moore machine. If it depends on both the state and the input, it's a Mealy machine. But we don't need to worry about that here. Um, 
so let's let's do the mood machine which is also the weather predictor which is also a branch predictor inside a modern CPU um, so four states um, which I'll call A, B, C, D. And these states have the following meaning. A is happy. B is okay. C is meh. And D is sad. So you go from happy in state A to less happy in state D. Um, And our inputs are either rain or sun, telling us what the weather is doing today. And maybe our outputs are singing and sleeping. And we live in the Pacific Northwest, so I'm going to make D our initial state. And, and here's the setup. Um, I'm basically going to tell you for a given state and a given input what's the new state and for a given state and a given input what's our output. And I'm going to draw this with an arrow. And on the arrow I'm going to list the input and then a slash and then the output. And this is going to look like this. OK, so if we're in state D, we're sad, and it's raining, then we're going to stay in our sad state, and our output is going to be sleep. So if it's currently raining and we wake up and it's still raining, we're going to stay sad, we're going to go back to sleep. If we're currently in our sad state and we wake up and it's sunny, uh, maybe we'll sing. And we'll go to state C, where we're kind of like, eh, you know, not too bad. And if we're in state C and it's raining, maybe we'll sing because we're still happy, but we'll go back to state D where we're sad. And the outputs I'm kind of making random. Um, so, so if we're kind of in this mass state and it's uh, sunny, then we're going to sing for joy and we're going to go to the state B where we're um, we're okay, and if we're in state B and it's sunny again, we're definitely going to sing. And we're going to go to state A, where we're like super happy. And if we're in state A and it's still sunny, we're going to keep singing and we're going to stay in state A. And if we're in state A and it rains all of a sudden, maybe we'll go to sleep because we've been up for a few days from the sun. But we go to state B where we're kind of okay. And if we're in state B and it rains, maybe we'll sleep some more and go to state C. So, so the particulars aren't super critical, um, but this is an example of, of how a given state machine would behave, right? We have four states, we have input, we have output. And this diagram tells us how we move from one state to another um, in response to the inputs, and it tells us what the, um, what the output will be. So we can define all kinds of engineering systems using state machines. Um, we can define a mood machine that says, you know, how our mood's going to change from day to day. You can make a halfway decent weather predictor with this, because the best predictor of tomorrow's weather is today's weather. So just sort of like say it's going to do whatever it's doing now, and you'll do better than, than a lot of science. Um, 
And when you build a CPU with a long pipeline, you want to figure out if branches are going to get taken or not inside conditional branches. You can use the same kind of machine to do a two-bit branch prediction. So for us, we can also use state machines to do language recognition to tell if some sort of word belongs to a given language. So we can build a state machine tailored to a given language and then feed words into it and it will tell us this is or is not part of the language. So here's a state S0, here's a state S1, here's a state S2. And I'm going to get pretty loose with my notation now. So this is a little different from what I just described. So. Um, a state with a star in it, that's what I'm going to call our initial state. That's where we start from. A state with a circle around it is what we call a recognized state. It's a little bit like a final state. And I'm not putting outputs on these transitions and, and Technically, I should have an arrow that says 0 and an arrow that says 1, but I'm just using commas here to have one arrow which says if you have a 0 or a 1, we're going to go to state 2. And the idea is we begin in our initial state, we read input one character at a time, and we follow the state diagram and move around from state to state. And at the end of the string, if we get to a recognized state, then we say that string that we saw is part of our language. And if we're not in a recognized state, then it wasn't part of our language. So if we start from S0, one string which will take us to a recognized state is just the string consisting of 0. If we're in here and we get a 0 input, we immediately move to state S2, and that's a recognized state. The string 1 by itself is not recognized. That'll leave us in S1. But a 1 followed by a 0 will take us to S2. So that's recognized. And a 1 followed by a 1 will also take us to S2. So this machine recognizes three input strings, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, if I add another possibility here, well, once we're in state two, if we just start seeing a pattern of ones, we're going to stay in state two. So this would also recognize zero one, zero one one, and so on or 101, and so on. All right, those are all recognized. Or any of these, followed by a 0, followed by a 0, or a 0 followed by a 1, 0, or a 0 followed by a 1, 1, and so on. All right, so you get the idea. Right, not how to make these machines, just how to use them to analyze input. Basically start at the initial state, each character comes in, move to the next state, indicated by the diagram at the end of your string. If you're in a state that's a recognized state, your word is part of the language. So we can do word recognition. And this is, this is straightforward to code, by the way. Right? If we have um, a diagram like this, we can write code. We could make a function called S0, something called S1, something called S2, and 
feed that function your input and have it return the state that you should move into. And so now just keep getting your characters each time you get a character, pass it to you know whatever state function you're in, take the return value, use that as your next state. And when you get to the end of your input, check the recognized flag on the state you're in, see if it's recognized or not. Uh, we can also use these these machines to modify strings. So here's here's another machine. And here I'm going to label my arrows with input slash output. So let's suppose my input string is uh, 11000011. What's the output string going to be? We're starting in S1, that's the initial state. Okay, so we read the first character as a 1. What state do we move into? S0, and what's our output? Right? Okay, now we're in S0 and we input a 1. What should we output and what state should we go to? Okay, so our input is a 1, so we're going to output a 0 and we're going to go to S1. Now we input a 0. We're going to go to S0 and we're going to output a 0. And now we're in S0 and we input a 0, so we're going to output a 1 and go back to S1. Input a 0, we're going to output a 0, go to S0. Input a 0, we're going to output a 1, go to S1. Input a 1, we'll go to S0 and output a 1. Input a 1, we'll go to S1 and output a 0. So this was our input, this is our output. What's the behavior of this machine? It inverts every other bit. So these bits are unchanged. And the other bits are inverted. And that, that makes sense once you know that's what it's doing because look what's happening. We start in S1. Whatever we input, that's what we're going to output. So the first bit's going to be unchanged, but then we're going to go into this new state. And if we're in S0, whatever we input, the opposite bit's going to get output. And then we're going to go back to our initial state again. So first state gets repeated, second state we complement. And we go back to the first, so it toggles every other bit. So what's that machine going to do? Yeah. It's just a tweak on the previous example. When we start off, the first bit's going to be repeated. The second bit's going to be complemented. The third bit will be repeated exactly. The fourth bit will be repeated exactly. The fifth one will be complemented. The sixth will be true. So we complement every third bit, starting with the second one.
Okay, I'm not going to write this up, but let me just show you. That works. Um, so this is a two-bit delay. So um, we start in state zero, zero, and we input a bit. And depending on what bit you input, you go to a different state. And if you put in a particular string of ones and zeros, the output will be the exact same string, but preceded by two extra zeros. So it's basically a two-bit shift register. And the way I made this was really by just kind of thinking about um, these states, which I called S0001 and so on. State 01 um, means that um, the last bit that you saw was a 1, and the bit before that was a 0. State 1, 1 means the bit you just saw was a 1, and the bit before that was a 1. 0, 0 means the last two bits you saw were both 0. And using that, you come up with a transition diagram and outputs that, um, that give you this delay effect. So analyzing state machines, pretty straightforward. Synthesizing state machines, harder, right? Just like in 250. Um, trying to come up with a diagram that produces some particular behavior. Um, but the more you do it, the easier it gets, right? The more you start to recognize patterns that you can use. Um, to make this happen. Okay, so let's do a recognition. So here's our initial state. Here's our recognized state. So what sorts of strings will this machine recognize? Let's just write some of these. So starting in S0, what's a string that will take us to S1? Zero. What's another string? Any number of ones followed by a zero. Okay. Because the ones just keep us here, and then a zero takes us to S1. What else? Zero followed by any number of ones. What else? Zero, zero recognized. So zero, 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 that would be recognized, unrecognized, recognized, that would be recognized. Zero. Same with that. Zero, any number of ones, and then another zero. Almost. Another zero. And another zero after that. I think we've got most of the pieces to generalize this. Why does it have to have two zeros at the end? 
because the first zero will take you to S1, the ones will leave you in S1, the second zero will take you back to S0, which is not a recognized stage. S1 oh. is the only recognized. Okay. So, so after doing some particular examples, then I kind of step back and think about like, so what's going on here? Well, one thing that's pretty straightforward to see is once we're in S1, ones don't matter. If we're in a recognized state, we can get in as many ones as we want. It's still going to be recognized. So any recognized string, we can throw in a bunch of ones at the end, right? So we could do 0, 0, 0, followed by a bunch of ones. That's still going to be recognized. And anything that's not recognized, we can throw in as many ones as we want and a zero will take us to a recognized stage. So if we have some string that's, that's, um, that, that's going to be recognized, right, if the string up to, the previ up to some point is not recognized, we can throw in a bunch of ones at that point. And then when we continue the string, we'll still be recognized. So what's, what's the one sentence wrap up for recognize strings. Anything with an odd number of zeros. Right, because you start inputting, if you have an even number of zeros, you're going to be an S0. If you have an odd number of zeros, you're going to be an S1. Whichever state you're in, the ones don't change your state. So this will basically be any string. with an odd number of zeros. Alright, well we don't usually worry too much about state machines in that form. Um, we're usually using them in some different context, um, some particular version of a state machine. So um, the most famous state machine is probably a Turing machine. So this is Alan Turing. This is the Enigma cipher. Uh, and all of that stuff. How many people here are not familiar with Alan Turing? Okay, um, really cool biography to look up. Um, Imitation Game is a pretty cool movie. Came out a few years ago. Um, on Alan Turing and the work of the code breakers in World War II. Um, so what is a Turing machine? Turing machine is a four tuple. Uh, S comma I comma F comma S zero. As usual, S is the set of states, S0 is the initial state, I is your alphabet, and F is the magic. Um, F goes from pairs of states and inputs to uh, states inputs and elements from this set R comma L. And so if we think of this as a physical machine, there's a paper tape or a magnetic tape, something we can read from and write to. And it's an infinite tape, which is nice. And there's a read-write head that can read a single character on this tape and can also rewrite that character. And there's a state table which says Given your present state and your input, what's your next state, what's your output, 
And which way, physically we would think, which way would you move the t tape? Well, we're going to talk about which way would we move the read right head. Um, even though, you know, on a real tape machine the tape moves and the head stays fixed, it's easier when we're writing this out on paper to think of the head itself as moving. So when we say right, we're going to think of moving to the right, which would actually be the tape moving to the left. So we'll think of um, head movement. And basically this machine will start in some initial state and it will look at the character under this head, that'll be the input, and it will look for an entry which says that state and that input. And if it finds an entry with that, it will use the remaining three elements here to say, okay, what's my next state going to be? What should I write onto the tape in place of what I just read? And should I move the head to the left or the right? So let's look in a, a, a sample state machine. Can you go to the PS's present state? Mm-hmm. So That's the character under the read right head, the input. Okay. NS is the next state. O is the output. That's what you're going to write onto the tape. And then RL is which way we're going to move that read right head. And if you try to go into a state and you don't find an entry for that state or you don't find an entry for that state in the given input, then your machine halts. So if you try to go into an undefined situation, the machine just stops running and that's the end of the action. Do you mean this to be a, a sequence of steps? No, or it's a, a collection. Of six different. Of six possible pairs of states and inputs. Now, are these six special? It's an example. Just example yeah. random ones. Mm hmm. Okay. Semi random. And in this case, the characters on the tape are either a zero or a one or a blank, and I'm using B for blank. So most of the tape is empty to begin with. It's filled with Bs. So we can think of a series of Bs. And then let's imagine there's a 0, 0, 1, 1, and then some more blanks. And let's suppose we're starting in S0. And let's suppose the read right head is sitting on top of that leftmost zero to begin with. And you turn the machine on and you want to see what it does. Okay, it's going to start off, it's in state S0. And the input is a zero. Okay. It's going to look in its state table and say, is there a rule for what I should do if I'm in state S0 and my input is a 0? And it's going to find that rule right up here. And it says what I should do is I should write a 1 in this place. So it'll put a 1 on there instead. It will change its state to S1. And it will move to the right. So now we come over here. And then it acts as if you had just turned it on, except now it's in state 1, and the input character under there is still a 0. So now it looks for a rule. If I'm in state 1 and the input is a 0, what should I do? Well, go through state 1, 0. That's this rule right here. And it says you should write a 1 in place of that. 
you should go to state S2 and you should move to the left. So now the read write head is sitting over this first digit. We're in state two and now it goes back and it says, is there a rule? So the input character here is a one. Is there a rule for being in state two with an input of one? And there's not, there's no rules for state two. The machine halts. So it took a tape that contained 0011 and it changed it to contain 1111. That's the whole thing the machine did. Make sense? So is S2 then in the recognized state? S2 is an unrecognized state. It's it makes it halt. But yeah, you could think of that as as similar. Okay, so start off with a bunch of blanks, and then let's have a one zero one, and then a bunch of blanks. And let's start with the read write head sitting above that. And our initial state is S0 and our input is a 1. Okay, turn the machine on. What is it going to do? Okay, so it's going to say state 0 inputs 1. That's this rule right here. It's going to write a 0. It's going to go to state S1. It's going to move the read write head to the right, which means now we have a 0 under there. So now we're in S1 with an input of, z of 0. What's it going to do next? Write a 1, loop to S2, and move to the left. Right, it's going to um, S1 with a 0, it's going to write a 1, go to state S2, and move to the left. Now it's in state S2 with a zero. That's not a recognized state. The machine halts. And so change 0011 one into 1111. And it changed 101 one into 011. One one. Is this useful? Who knows? So, so, so uh, applying this to the, to the Enigma machine, as I understood the way the whole thing worked it was the Enigma machine, there was manual work to discover information about the coding before, the, before they could decipher what mm -hmm. the Enigma machine works. So is this, the six examples you've got up there, is that, is, are those examples of the work that people would do manually to figure out what possible rules you could use to, to, to get it to do this. Effectively, yes. In other, words, in other words, they found out that if you saw a certain character, like you were talking about before, like E occurs mm -hmm. more often than any letter in the alphabet, if they discovered how to, how, which of these rules you would do do with that situation, then you can create the, that one of those rules. Mm -hmm. And then they create a bunch of these rules, and this machine would actually then go through and do the decoding process? Yeah, and I don't know to what degree this was actually used in cracking Enigma, right? So Alan Turing and the other people were working on the mathematics, right, of, of the Enigma system and discovered patterns. So he was just trying that to could build be used. using this to actually build a physical machine? And I don't know to what degree this, this was actually turned into a physical machine for that purpose. The Turing machine that we're talking about was actually developed by Alan Turing to study computation. There were questions in, in the 20s about limits of computation, what's computable, what's not. And in order to do that, you needed to formalize the notion of an algorithm. And this was a way to formalize what it means to process an algorithm, right? And then this was used to tackle things like, you know, um, limits of computability and so on. And in, in the, the popular movies and books, right, there's big machines that are actually chunking away on the stuff. And I don't know where Hollywood ends and reality starts with that. <laughs> um, 
but this this is a framework for a general purpose computer, right? And and so would that just be like an instruction set? Yeah, like yeah. It's a very quirky kind of assembly language or machine language. Um, I guess that should be assembly language. Um, but nonetheless, this is capable of doing any computation that you can do in C or Python or Java or anything else. Right? And when you come up with a new language, you, you ask the question, is it Turing complete? Which really says, is this language good enough to do anything we can do with a Turing machine? And that's sort of the gold standard. Right? Um, that's considered to be computationally complete. So Wednesday, we will um, we'll play with some more examples of this. We'll look at some online simulations of Turing machines um, and see what we can do with them. And then we'll, um, we'll talk about classes of problems and see what's computable and what's not. And that will probably take us through the end of our course.